Back in the Hack Shack for part two of the 1917 King Baritone Saxophone Restoration. Welcome to Hack a Week. So welcome to part two where we are going to get the tarnish off from this thing and continue on with some repairs. Let's get started. I cleaned up this key which used to look like this. Now it looks like this. It took about maybe five minutes of just scrubbing with a toothbrush and this uh, Haggerty silver foam. Really good stuff. It's just a paste, kind of foamy. You just put it on and scrub a little. You can do it with uh, a brush. You can do it with cloth, whatever, and it'll remove the tarnish. This stuff is really intense. It's um, when it's this black, it's like a coating. It's really tough to get off. And there's another thing that I use, which is this stuff. It's just a Connoisseur's Silver Jewelry Cleaner. This stuff is designed to just, basically you dip the part into this solution. It's got a little, little thing to put the parts in. If it's, you know, like jewelry parts, that is. I've only got about that much. Of, whew, stuff is strong smelling too. So if I brush it onto everything, it'll give me like a head start on what I can then follow up with on the Haggerty Silver Foam. I'm gonna let this soak in here for a couple of minutes just to show you what it can do. Okay, so here we are about maybe three minutes later. All that tarnish is gone. And now if I get after this with the Silver Foam, it's gonna make things a whole lot easier. So, what I think I'm going to do is take a little acid brush, brush this stuff over the entire body of the thing outdoors, because this stuff really stinks, and give it all a good head start on getting that tarnish off. So we're outside here at the Hackaweek compound, otherwise known as our house. <laughs> I'm just going to brush this stuff until I run out of it. I don't have a lot but I'm just gonna brush it all over the horn. You can see how it just almost instantly starts working. And the reason I'm doing it mostly is because of this really, really, really dark stuff, which takes a while to take off. Now, if this was in a tank of this stuff, it would all be gone. All the tarnish would be gone. But of course, the moisture content of it has evaporated, so there it is. But uh, at least it gave it a good start. Sure would be nice to have a big tank to just boil out saxophones. I'm gonna get after it now with the Haggerty foam, silver foam. This stuff won't evaporate really fast, so we'll just start scrubbing it on there. And we're gonna let it sit for a while after we do. So this is starting to dry out a little. I've got everything coated. I'm gonna see if I can keep it a little more active by Put a little water on it, and then just continue to scrub. Okay, time for the rinse. I didn't really take everything off. I didn't expect it to on the first pass. It's going to take multiple passes to get it all, all that tarnish off, but this is a good start. Well, the doctor looks pretty good after the initial first pass of removing the tarnish. Not too bad at all. So on the next pass, I'll probably get rid of most of the stuff you see here, this little bit that's left over, some of these darker areas. Oop, there's, a, there's a dent there that's got to be pulled back, deformed tongue holes. Um, what was the other thing I was going to show you? This is probably from natural rubber, a rubber band that was around here at some point, which will tarnish the hell out of silver. I may not be able to get that out. We'll just have to see. I might have to just sand that down. And I'm looking into a Caswell um, handheld silver plating setup. Check into that. This is interesting. The bell looks all gold colored and I'm almost thinking it might maybe be gold plated. I'm not real sure, but that sure looks like a goldish tint to me. It doesn't look like brass. It doesn't look like tarnished brass usually does. There is all of this black um, 
oxide on here like it's silver, but here's a clue that I noticed. There is a scratch in one area. Let's see if the camera picks this up right there. That scratch is silver underneath. So it may be that it was silver plated and then the bell was gold plated. I don't know if that was original from the manufacturer or maybe some owner had that done. But I can take that to a jeweler friend of mine and he can test the metal and let me know if it is indeed gold plated. But anyway, um, good start on removing the tarnish. Got the boys out here guarding the doctor, Seamus and Mr. Brown. Yeah. Anyway, did a little more uh, tarnish removal today with some of the Haggerty silver foam on the other side of the doctor and um, both sides are now pretty well stripped of all that nasty black stuff we've still got a ways to go it's going to take some hand polishing now to get the rest of this oxidation and tarnish off some of these spots are where I was uh, wiping it down with some of that tarnish remover and it dripped on the bottom and hung there so some of that stuff will uh, probably just polish out but I've got the crook pretty well cleaned up that was pretty intense pretty tight spaces to get into with the toothbrush and everything there but it cleaned up pretty well that Haggerty uh, stuff does a pretty good job now we get to move on to all of the key work which is just as bad if not worse this stuff is just black. totally black believe it or not that's supposed to be silver it's totally black but the first thing we're gonna do is just remove all the pads and get all the material out behind them. As I mentioned, these are the original pads and they're glued in with high glue so I can clean that out with water. I might try to pickle these to clean them, which is basically salt and vinegar and some heat in a pot and let them uh, soak and see what happens. But first thing we need to do is get all the old felts off and all of the old pads off. How about we apply a little science and chemistry? I have one of the keys soaking in a solution of soda ash, which is sodium carbonate, and some salt. Um, the recipe I mixed up was uh, with a gallon of water I added one half cup of soda ash and four teaspoons of salt. Stirred it up really well so it's all in solution. Lined this plastic container with aluminum foil and what we've got going on here is this tarnish is basically a silver sulfide that builds up on the surface of the silver. Some metals have more of an affinity for sulfur than others and aluminum is one of those metals. So since we have salt in solution here along with the sodium carbonate, we've got this nice electrolyte going on and what we're going to do is we are going to lift all of the sulfur from the silver. It's going to transfer to the aluminum and we should end up taking off all of this tarnish if we let it soak for a while. Basically we're doing electroplating right now. You can see the bubbles coming off from it. Um, so there is definitely a reaction going on there that is electrochemical. And I'm going to let it sit for a while and see how this works out. If this does the job I think it's going to do, I'm going to make a whole mess of this, probably about 20 gallons, in my bathtub, line it with a towel, that way I won't scratch the bathtub, then line it with some aluminum foil, drop every single thing in there, the body, the key work, all of it, and just let it sit for a while and see what kind of results we get. I'm going to let this sit for a while, come back to it later, and see what it does for the tarnish. It may not completely remove it, but it may loosen it up enough too to make it just wipe right off easily. So we're at about uh, 10 maybe 15 minutes that that's been in there and it was bubbling a lot and it smelled a little sulfury because well sulfur look at that a lot of that now is just wiping right off so it's probably gonna take uh, a couple of attempts because we got to get through this first layer so to speak Just give it all a good, quick wipe. And that took off a good 80% of it right there. 
not too bad. So let's put it back in and let it sit another 10 or 15 minutes and see what we get after that. Kerplunk. Now it's got to be in contact with the aluminum foil, by the way, for it to work. Well, I mixed up an entire bathtub full of that solution and uh, soaked everything in it. Had it all completely submersed and it probably stayed in uh, for a total of 40 minutes, something like that. Um, after about 20 minutes, I took all the key work out, wiped them down with a cloth and then put them all back and then flipped over the body a couple of times just to have the air bubbles work themselves out in different ways. But quite a bit of the stuff is gone now and this stuff should polish out pretty easy because uh, it's all been kind of loosened up a bit. So a little bit of uh, time now with some Haggerty silver foam on this and on the body. I think we'll be ready to start straightening things out and doing a little bit of pre-assembly, but there's a little bit of soldering to do. I decided to do a little work on the bell before I do anything else. Just tired of looking at these dents before I start polishing anything. I should try to get all these out. So I'm going to work on that right now with this bodywork dolly, which has got a pretty close radius to what this is, and a rawhide mallet and see what we can do to work out some of these dents. I have no idea what this was about, why there are multiple bang marks going inward on this, but whatever. Let's see what we can do to get rid of those. What I'm trying to do is get the apex of that dolly right on the dent and then just give it a whack. First get the, the little dimples out. I can come back later and try to get a radius back in this because it's actually kind of flattened out right now. It's looking pretty good. I got most of them out. Now I'm just going to take the dolly and push it in here and by hand just work it back and forth like this and this. That's a little flat spot right there. And I can actually see by the light ping from my overhead light, just where it's pushing against. I don't think I'm ever going to get all of those dimples completely out because the metal is just deformed. I can't get squished metal to get thick again. There's a little high spot there. trick is to just really gently work it. You don't want to smack too hard. Then you're just going to go the other way. And just a little more smoothing. That's that. I'm going to call it. You know, on the other side of the bell, we got a couple good hits there as well. I'm going to see if I can work those out the same way. Well, that looks pretty good. Those are pretty much gone. Got one more right there to tackle now. I think we'll just leave that alone. So back on tarnish removal duty. I might stay here in the backyard with a little jazz music playing in the background. Scrubbing away. Patience and determination alone are omnipotent. So say the crows. And so the results of two and a half hours of work cleaning and a little bit of polishing I think these are almost good to go like they are. I might hit them with a little bit of uh, polish and maybe hit them with a jeweler's rouge polishing cloth, but whew, that's done. Back onto the body. Um, take a look at this tone hole. 
what do you see wrong there? You see how it is not flat? It's actually low right there. The reason it's low right there is because this key guard got bumped, slammed in right here, pushed that in, pushed the body in, bent the tone hole a little. That needs to be popped back up. If I can bend this whole thing where these come up and this pushes in, watch what happens to the tone hole when I put tension. See how this comes up and these drop in? So it's kind of like this entire, whoa. It's like this entire tube needs to be squished this way a little bit. I'm gonna protect the top of this with some uh, cardboard. Or nothing at all. And then, um, let's just see what we can do here. Let's just try putting a little pressure on this. See what happens. That actually brought it up a pretty fair amount. And this part's pushing in a little bit, so I think I'm gonna stop right there. Just try prying it up here and here. It's a lot closer. I had almost two millimeters, and now I'm down to maybe one, so it definitely helped. I've got a tone hole here that's going to be a bit of a challenge to repair. I uh, believe this is called the F sharp um, key. And this chimney flat out came off. It was loose, I pulled on it, it came right off. So I've got it prepped and cleaned up. Pretty challenging area to try to solder this because of the guard that's around it. But I'm going to wire it into place. And I'm going to try using this stuff. It's called uh, Tix solder. Um, melts a little bit lower temperature. Also comes with anti-flux and flux. The anti-flux is basically a red ochre. I've used this in jewelry making. You paint this on, it dries, and it keeps the solder from adhering and flowing into that area. The flux does the opposite. It will clean the metal for you and the solder will flow into that area. So if I get this around this area in here away from that little thin line where I want the solder to be, let that dry, put some on the outside of the chimney, and I'll leave the inside alone. Get this set in place, wired in place, maybe with some copper wire wrapped around it. It's gonna be a little challenging to line this up. And we'll get some heat on it and give this Tix solder a try. I've got some of my own uh, red ochre mix painted onto here because the tick stuff was a little weird. It doesn't really want to hold the stuff in suspension and paint on that well. It's almost like there's too much water and not enough of the red ochre. So I've got that on here. I've got some on the chimney. Now I just got to get everything in place with flux on both parts and we'll be ready to solder. Everything's wired in place. Hopefully it doesn't slip. Here we go. I'm going to have to get a lot of heat in here, I think, especially on the body. Hopefully nothing else comes loose on me while I'm doing this. This is going to be tricky. Like I said, this is supposed to melt at a much lower temperature, so let's, let's see what happens. Yeah, it does. Getting it to flow into the areas I want is a bit tricky. I'm gonna try putting a little bit of flux into it here while it's hot, which may help a little bit. Well, it's flowing out okay on the inside of the chimney, but I'm not getting it to flow into the crack. Alright, just a little bit. And maybe I can use the flux brush to kind of get it to move around a little bit. Follow the heat. As I've done in other cases where I have soldered things up here. A little bit of flux, 
And of course, all these goofy angles that I'm having to work at. It's kind of tricky. But we are, we're doing it. It's, it's getting there. We're making it happen. And let's say I like this ticks stuff. Once you get used to it, I think we've done it. Okay, let's cut the wire away here. See what we ended up with. Gonna clean up the area with a little bit of steel wool. This turned out pretty well, other than a little bit of excess solder here that I can get off with some solder wick. I'm just gonna warm it up with my soldering iron. Put the solder wick on there and let it suck up that little bit extra that's poking out on the outside. I could leave it alone, but since I can clean it up, I might as well. Well, I must say I'm pretty pleased with that. Looks good. I don't think there's going to be any leaks. I can see solder in the joint all the way around. So that one's done. Now we can move on to some of these tone hole guards. First step is to remove this brace so I'm going to heat it up here and here and just lift it off and I can straighten it out and then work on getting rid of this dent which is massively deforming this tone hole right here. This should come loose pretty easy. Oh, there it goes. Let's get this one. There's a slight lift here on this. There we go. I want to pop this back up. I think I can do it by applying pressure from the inside and bulge it up this way if I put a wooden buck right here that's got the same radius as this. So to get that radius, I'm going to use my carpenter's profile gauge, push it down on there. Now I've got a profile I can cut out of a piece of wood, some hardwood, put it on here. Get in here with maybe some channel lock players that I can reach in with that jaw, put the other one on top of the wood and squeeze, and in theory, push this back up. We'll find out. So there's my wooden buck. I radiused a little bit on each side so it doesn't leave a crease. It looks like about the right radius. Let's get it set up here and see if this is going to work. This is not the most conventional way to do this. Um, most repair techs would be using a dent ball on this. I don't have a set of those, so I get creative with whatever I've got. There's more than one way to skin the proverbial cat. So, let's see. Here we go. We're going to squeeze and see what happens. It's definitely going to displace metal. It's just about, is it going to do it in the proper manner? Just go a little at a time. The tone hole just leveled out pretty nicely. So I think I'll stop there and pull it off. And see what our results are. It's still a little bit dented in right there, but this part came out really nice and the tone hole is much better so maybe uh, a little more back this way but the main problem is this bumps into the tone hole here so I'll probably uh, do a little grinding on this these are cheap so it's about to become a sacrificial c-clamp for this purpose good. I think that's as good as it gets. And the tone hole is within about a millimeter right there. So there's gonna be some filing going on on the rest of this to get this all flattened out. But that looks pretty darn good. 
I might be able to do something that same way over here on this one. It's dented in a little bit. And indeed, we did. We did pull it out a little more, and I think that's um, I think that's good enough. I'm not gonna mess with it too much more. I'm happy with that. After a lot of tweaking, bending, and fitting, I've got this tone hole guard all ready to solder back on here. Also went through the tone hole here and leveled it in my flat piece of brass. No light leaks going on now. So we're ready to solder that guard back in place. I've got everything prepped here. I've got my um, red ochre painted around the outside areas of the pads where I want to solder this on. And I've also got some pieces of the Tix solder pounded flat, really thin, stuck in place with a little bit of resin. I'm going to see if I can carefully position that guard in place, wire it on there with some copper wire, and solder it up. All wired up, stuck in place. Let's get heat on it. See what we get. Hopefully this just kind of settles right into place. The solder flows out. We don't have to add any solder to it. Gonna heat this up first because that's gonna suck up some heat. And then I'll work my way down to the body, get that nice and warm. I'm gonna do one at a time. I'm gonna try to add just a bit just to test the temperature of the metal. And yes, indeed, some of it did wick in there. That's one. Let's get this one next. Once again, gonna try adding just a bit, just to check the temperature of everything. like that bonded okay. I'm going to add a little more. And let's get the last one here. are done. That is what this guard looked like when we started out and this is what it looks like now. All fixed. Nice and straight again. Good clean solder joints. Tone holes all straightened out. Leveled out. Ready for a key to be installed. That is a wrap for this video. Next time we're going to move on to doing some more repairs, mainly this tone hole guard, a few other things here and there, and we can get started fitting the keys, making sure that they're all level with the tone holes, everything works okay, doing any swedging we need to do on the hinges, and then check the hinge rods for straightness, lots of things to go yet. Then we can probably get to the point where we're putting the pads on this thing, inching ever closer to a playable instrument. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And until next time.